So we're starting in 1850, and you're going to hear a lot of names uh, about Island Park. You're going to hear a lot of names about people. You're maybe going to want to know more about those people, and I will say that um, so do I, and each one of them could be their own presentation. So um, <clears throat> if you want to know more, please feel free to come on up, or you can also send us uh, a question on our website. Um, you're going to hear Island Park referred to by different names, Noble Island, Phelps Island, and finally Island Park. In 1856, uh, William Noble buys the western half of the island from the government, and a relative, Orson Noble, also buys the other part. But Hennepin County uh, assessor records also indicate that between 1856 and 1874, three other people own parts of the island. Also laying claim are Jacob Schutte, Dana Butoff, and Carrington Phelps. Noble Island is known to be densely wooded and very hilly. I spent a lot of time out there the last couple of weeks, and boy, is it hilly. Okay. By 1875, St. Paul attorney Carrington Phelps owns the entire island. He renames it after himself, Phelps Island. The Minneapolis Tribune writes in August 1876, Phelps Island, or Phelps is making a park of his island in the upper lake, building a summer residence. Cottages for summer use can be built in town and then taken apart and set out on cars at no very great expense. Of course, we should prefer to see permanent structures. All classes must have accommodations, and if they can afford a cabin, let them have it. Also note where Phelps's neighbor on Enchanted Island, Charles Zimmerman, has built a drawbridge by 1891 that connects the two islands. So you can see the star, that's where Carrington Phelps is going to build his lodge. And you can see a little space right between where the two islands are, where uh, Charles Zimmerman has built a bridge. The following year, Phelps does build a summer lodge on the south end of his island. There are no roads, all transportation is by boat. In the 2007 Laker Pioneer article titled, Island Park, the very early years, WHS President Jeff Magnuson writes, there was a large garden and a cow kept for fresh milk. Visitors would find the Phelps family taking tea under the grand old trees, enjoying the summer breeze of the upper lake. They enjoy the wild solitude and natural wonders of the island for the next several years. This is a 2019 photo, it shows the hill. You can see that hill? on the south tip of the island where Phelps had his family lodge. And again, I put a little star there. And this was just taken a couple days ago. In 1884, just to give you some perspective of what was happening out here, a new Narrows is used for the first time in September. It's located a little north of the Old Passage. Sorry about that funny sound. A ferry operates until 1910 when the first bridge is built. And the benefit of the new Narrows is its ability to accommodate larger boats into the upper lake. So that's going to make a difference for travel and transportation to Phelps Island. In 1885 and 86, the St. Paul Globe runs some postings reading, Phelps Island has choice lots for sale, price $300 to $500, and offering choice lots on Phelps Island five minutes from the Spring, Spar Spring Park Station, special inducement to those who will build this year. Early Phelps Island investors on the island include Almond Sampson and Charles Lewis. Lewis is believed to have built a home. Sampson may have been only an investor. We cannot find a home for him. <clears throat> the Great Northern Railroad becomes involved in development, building the first hotel on the island. It's managed by the Woolnows. James is the train conductor, and Amanda manages the hotel. The hotel was a popular summer destination for dance parties aboard the Me Too, anchored offshore, and moonlight cruises. Called the plantation by guests, the hotel takes on the appearance of a southern house party. And this photo is um, taken in 1905. Um, and you're going to find out why. This 1892 map shows Woolnows, not yet called Maple Heights, it's just called Woolnows, 
And Almond Sampson's property is below Pelican's Point. You can see where the star is. Um, Woolnaus is on the top. And then Phelps, I, um, Phelps's Lodge is on the southern tip. You can see down below. Okay. In 1896, Woolnaus have neighbors. Winthrop Chamberlain is right below. George Squires is below that, and he's uh, believed to be an investor uh, only. And George Beach now replaces Sampson below Pelican Point. Phelps is um, still visible on the southern tip, but would be destroyed by fire within a few years. Okay. This is a photo of the property today, where Woolnows and Chamberlain's Lookout Lodge were located. The property is all now, as you can see, Lake Winds Condos. And you can see where Maple Heights uh, was, and then down a little ways, Lookout Lodge. The lower photo is Lookout Lodge, built by Winthrop Chamberlain. He was the editor of the Minneapolis Journal. He used Lookout Lodge for his summer estate until the uh, late 1930s, when the 1937 directory information notes his residence is now in Miami, Florida. Lookout Lodge um, was owned next by the florist Hans Roseacre, and by 1945, it was the summer home of meat market owner John Tyson. John's daughter, Barb, oh, next, there she is, um, is photographed with her brother's dog, Chubby. This photo was taken shortly before Brother Jack returned from World War II, and you can see the imposing stone foundation of the lodge in this photo. From an interview with Norma Tyson, she remembers that the house sat on about an acre. The side facing the water had a three-sided porch and lawn facing Maple, ha Maple Heights. At the time that they lived there, it was then called Tippy Walken. <clears throat> the roadside had a long drive to the house, an apple orchard between the street and the house, a caretaker's cottage with one bedroom and a kitchen, uh, attached to the house uh, was a, uh, and it was attached to the house by an archway, and then a large garage that housed the laundry. The main house had three levels. Level one had a large living room, dining room, and kitchen. The second level had five to six bedrooms. The third level had three bedrooms for the servants. The interior was wood paneling large middle staircase with a wall painting done when the Chamberlains lived there in the house. The Tysons were sold the house fully furnished by the Rose Acres. So we don't know how much of the Chamberlain furniture was also there when the Rose Acres bought it. A long dock went into the bay and they had a floating swimming raft. They had a bathhouse that had two rooms, one side for the ladies and one side for the guys. Uh, Norma remembers walking to Spring Park to buy candy. She saw the Delotero after it burned. She had a little boat she took into the Narrows with her dog and remembers being rocked about when the larger boats passed around. And Norma is here. There she is. Norma, raise your hand. Had a wonderful conversation with her and I thank her so much for her information. Really helped put a lot of the pieces together. Minneapolis businessman George Beach bought the property below Pelican's Point, previously owned by Almond Sampson. These photos offer a glimpse into the beach, into Beach Knoll. That was the name of their home. These photos, um, the picture are George's father and his father-in-law on the porch playing a game. And then the uh, photo below that is the interior of the main parlor. And then the larger photo is taken from the house toward their boathouse with a small, their small launch called the White Lily. And you can see Pelican's Point right in front. They had a beautiful boathouse. And they also had a very large, uh, larger boat as well. <coughs> Next. So this is that property today, and it is Pelican Point Development. So here we are in the new century, 1900. It brings a lot of changes for Carrington Phelps and his island. By 1901, Phelps Lodge on the southern tip of the island is gone. The Minneapolis Journal runs articles about litigation 
over bridge and property owners' requests for road improvements. In April 1901, the Western Realty Company in Minneapolis takes control of Phelps Island under a default on mortgage interest payments by Phelps. Three bridges and two roads exist on the island. The roads are in poor condition and homeowners complain that they paid for improvements that were never made. Sound familiar? <laughs> Platting and improvements begin immediately. Finally, one year later, April 1902, so the litigation's still going on a year later. The Minneapolis Journal reads, Carrington Phelps knocked out in Supreme Court. So Phelps is trying to hang on. The Minnetonka uh, case is ended by a decision handed down by the Supreme Court of Minnesota. Today, the long drawn out litigation over ownership of Phelps Island in Upper Lake Minnetonka has been settled. And the land finally passes out of the hands of Carrington Phelps and into those of the Western Realty Company. We just heard a year before that it had passed. Phelps was still hanging on. I'm taking this to the Supreme Court. Mr. Phelps, some years ago, placed a heavy mortgage on the unplatted portion of the island, and the mortgage was foreclosed by the Northern Trust Company. <clears throat> the American Suburban Company, Tuxedo Park Company, and Thorpe Brothers began to advertise property sales. Woolnow's, uh, Woolnow's Inn continues to attract visitors as development is ongoing. Let's see what the next one is. Yes, good. In October 1901, the Minnesota football team has a retreat day at Woolnow's before the big Iowa game. At the beginning of the 1902 season, so a year later, or six months later, Woolnow buys 200 feet of an adjoining lakefront to build a new dining room and dance hall. The Minnesota team comes again that September for a training week, and the inn stays open. There's a lot more about this. It said there was more than training going on. You'll see that there is a girls' club not far away. Uh, so uh, the inn stays open until December, and at the beginning of the 1903 summer season, Woolnows, who um, are, uh, now, is now called Maple Heights, it's recently completed renovations. It's adding a building measuring 110 feet by 45 feet. The inn is painted white and it has a green shingle roof. The first floor is a dance hall, 45 feet by 47 feet, high colonial porch and a second story balcony. The second floor has 15 rooms with baths and closets. In July 1904, Amanda has been managing the hotel business for 12 years. She can accommodate up to 200 visitors, she, uh, seating for 175 in the dining room, and the steamer Mayflower arrives promptly every day at noon at the hotel landing. It's quite the place. There's uh, James there below and Amanda looking quite serious on the other side. Phelps Island development is interrupted in August 1904. The tornado that does extensive damage to the eastern shores. Details are shared in the Minneapolis Journal on August 22nd, 1904. One vortex of the tornado's wrath centered on the eastern end of Phelps Island. Maple Heights suffered bitterly. Okay, they just did a huge renovation. The entire roof of the new inn was deposited in the marsh near Black Lake. Guests huddled in the main room when this happened, and as the electric lights went out, there was a fearful panic. Most of the other Woolnow buildings are more or less damaged. Although extensive damage exists on the island, cleanup ignites development. Woolnow set to work managing rapid repairs and salvaging what remains of their summer season. Two days after the tornado, they hold their weekly hop. Guests are made comfortable in cottages, and meals are served. The electric lights are on, and most guests elected to finish the season. The inn remains open through September, and the Woolnows remain until January to complete renovations before closing. A third story is added, with 12 large sleeping rooms by May 1905. Newspapers advertise 85 guest rooms with well-kept grounds, boats, and private dances weekly. Woolnow's 
Woolnow's Inn becomes a post office, becomes post office Woolnow, Lake Minnetonka, in May 1909. Visitors can ride the train to Spring Park and streetcar boat service directly to the Woolnow Dock. Buses meet the train, seven cottages have been added, plus a tennis court, a bathing beach, row boats, and good fishing. All beginning for $2 a day or $12 a week. Beginning in 1912, the Woolnows uh, return from, uh, for the Lake Minnetonka season from their summer home now. They go summer in Florida. Amanda manages the inn for an additional four years until she dies in September of 1916. Managers and caretakers come and go. A bit of bad luck is noted in the newspaper in April 1916 when caretaker John Wilfred commits suicide in his cottage on the grounds. Eventually, in July 1920, the property is sold to the Minnesota Christian Ministry, renamed Tippy Walken in 1923. It lasts another 41 years and is raised in 1964. Many people um, think that this is the last hotel in Lake Minnetonka. Um, it actually is the last one on the lake, but there is one surviving hotel between Lake Langdon and Surfside, Sunset Villa, still there. Next. Oh, go back one. That photo, because we didn't have a photo of the uh, roof blowing off, um, is a photo of Cook's Bay and some of uh, what happened at the, uh, during the tornado. Immediately after the tornado in 1906, efforts to sell property on the island continue. In a marketing statement by Thorpe Brothers, the island is renamed again, North Shore Park, formerly Phelps Island. Improvements and beautiful beaches are advertised to potential buyers. Next. Minneapolis-based Tuxedo Park um, Company fast becomes the island's biggest developer. They're responsible for increased road development, dock building, and the charming names of the cottage neighborhoods that we still enjoy today. And this is one of the photos that they have in their catalog for sales, uh, the Whipple Dock in 1916. Tuxedo Park sales read, beautifully wooded Phelps Island, prices and terms to fit any pocketbook. The map shows the names of the neighborhoods in 1916. Seton, Witchwood, Avalon, Arden, Pembroke, and Devon. Whipple and Douglas are added in 1925. In 1910, John Iverson, born in Sweden, had been in America for just seven years. He began clearing trees and building roads for the Tuxedo Park Company. He bought property and he hired the Mound Lumber Company to build his home. John paid a $10 monthly mortgage, a third of his monthly income. His wife and children lived with his parents in Maple Plain until the house was completed. John lived in a work camp on the island during the week and joined his family on Sundays. The Iverson family were among the earliest year-round residents. Maybe some of you have heard the story about the horses you see in the photo. That's Dick and Jerry. They had to swim onto the island across the narrowest part of Cook's Bay, as it was the quickest way to get them there. John bought them in Mount and uh, rode them over to the closest area, and they swam across. John told his son Walter that he noticed that when he was working, the other workers who had horses received higher wages. So we went and bought two horses. The Iverson's first cabin, um, shown on the right, is in the 1930s at Devon and Manchester. That's a 1930s photo. It was built in 1910. John was very industrious. He had an ice company, a large ice house, and in 1919, he started a baggage and bus delivery service. Grandson Donnie Ball. Say said his grandfather didn't know how to drive when he started the business. 
The Ford Motor Company sent an instructor to give driving lessons to John so that he could go and pick up his new truck. By, <laughs> there's so much more to that story, it's wonderful. By 1923, he had a 35 passenger truck tripling as the school bus, a passenger bus, and furniture delivery truck. The Iverson school bus contract was passed to son-in-law Al Bull, keeping the contract in the family for 43 years. Oh, go back. The house on the left is that cottage today. And you will see the Iverson house pop up again. Next. Lafayette and Diana Wheelock built their cabin on Essex and Brunswick, Brunswick in Witchwood. The cabin, noted to be the third on the island, is on the upper right. The cabin today is now part of a multi-level house. You can see the outline of the original space in the photo below. And then I'm going to show you another photo in just a second. So you can see that the multi-levels. But you can see how that rectangle there is what is the original cabin. Lafayette is a very interesting character. He enlisted in the Civil War when he was 15, and he was discharged by 17, and he made his way to Minnesota by 1871. He had 15 children with two different wives at two different times, and his youngest, Doris, raised her family on this property. She lived here her entire life, and they had renovations and made it a year-round home. So show the next one. And that is the other side of that. So if you look to the farthest right upper, you'll see the little piece that I just showed you. And then they added the back part and the garage. Over the years, it's been added onto. In 1916, the tuxedo company hires Swedish immigrant Leonard Shadeen to captain a launch service and set him on a course of becoming one of Phelps Island's most beloved residents. Captain Shadeen begins offering boat service from Seton to Witchwood, Arden, and Chester Park docks. In an interview years later, Cap Shadeen said the tuxedo company financed his first boat. They bought it for him. With his earnings, ferrying passengers from the train depot to the docks, he eventually bo bought his boat outright. And just a little side note, he was bought out by John Iverson a few years later. John Iverson is amazing. Next. Should, oh, let's go back one. Go back one. Um, the photo on the far left uh, came to me just a few days ago by a family that we will talk about a little bit later. Um, that's the photo. Um, they live in a cabin next door to where the Shadines lived. And you can go, go to the next photo and you'll see the little cabin. This little cabin is where the Shadines lived until they died. Um, it was torn down. Before it was torn down, they found a box of Cap Shadine's personal items up in the attic. Oh, wow. And there are some photos in there. and receipts that would, are just amazing. It's like a holy grail to people that find that stuff cool. Um, Shadeen married Minneapolis beauty shop owner, Hansie Patterson, a Pedersen, in 1938. That's Hansi with him. Leonard is 54 and Hansi is 51 when they marry. This is their first marriage. They remain together in the cottage on Arden Commons until Hansi dies in 1960 in the 1960s, and Leonard dies in 1975. I have lots of photos of them also in these, holding hands and really enjoying each other's company. The story of the Henny, Henry Anderson cabin, and that's not misspelled, was told by daughter Nancy Herbst. That's her picture there, uh, graduation photo. In 1915, my father's family purchased a summer cottage on Pembroke, at Pembroke on Phelps Island. They commuted from, the Minneapolis, from their Minneapolis home by train and streetcar boat. Island Park was a vacation getaway where many Minneapolis residents spent their summers. My father purchased the two lots next door to his parents. In 1917, when my parents married, they contracted with the Island Construction Company to build a cottage for $325. They paid $150 on completion and $10 monthly each month until it was paid off. 
Gradually, the cottage was transformed into a year-round home. Nancy says, I was born in 1931, and I lived there all my life until I married in 1952. And you can see um, the map where the, the streetcar boat would um, stop at the different places, Spring Park, and then go on to Woolnows, and then come down to Pembroke. The Cub Cuban family, I want to say Cuban, but Cuban family, moved into the Avalon neighborhood clubhouse at Devon in Manchester. You can see it on the right, on the left. One of the five on the island, as each community had its own clubhouse. Dorothy Cubbin, that's her on the far left, down on the bottom, the little one, uh, says grandmother Anna owned the house until she deeded it to her daughter Christine in the 40s. Christine was, her mom, was um, Dorothy's mom. It was damaged in the 1965 tornado, condemned and then burned down. The image on the right is the Witchwood neighborhood clubhouse that's still standing and is a private residence. You see, they look kind of similar. Kind of cool. Hello. I'm Dorothy Cuba. <gasps> that's Dorothy. <laughs> and there's little Dorothy right there. Thank you, Dorothy. Wow. <laughs> this is so cool. <laughs> That's me. Next. 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 Okay. Okay. Seton Cliff. The Seton Club was organized in Minneapolis with a mission to establish a Catholic social center in downtown Minneapolis for working women of all ages, young and, and old, young and older, district, uh, to develop fellowship and acquaintances. In 1912, the American Suburban Realty Company, we've heard about them, donated property overlooking Cook's Bay for the guild to build a Lake Minnetonka cottage. And you can see where the star is. That's where they built the club. James J. Hill, whose wife was a devoted Catholic and did have an interest in this club, pledged $1,000 to a building fund. And the Great Northern Railroad built a permanent train platform to be known as Seton Station. And we know that, of course, the Great Northern Railroad was James J. Hill. The Minneapolis Morning Tribune of 29 May 1914 reported that the Phelps Island Clubhouse had opened. This is a good one here. During the summer of 1916, the summer breeze was, quote, all Phelps Island news for Phelps Island people. Consider the first Upper Lake newspaper, four editions were published by, quote, for modest but wide awake Phelps Island property owners, mainly as a source of in innocent amusement and to acquaint Phelps Island with its people and the people with each other. So said its publishers. And that is, I wish I had a better photo, but that's them down there. They had just come from a swim. Publishers were uh, Ludwig Coles, Wilfred Craigness, Leslie Delap, and John Hudak. Plans to continue publication the following summer were interrupted by World War I, and each of the founders joined the army. You'll be happy to know that each returned, and some had future cottages on the island. Summer Breeze postings next, included information about residents and lived up to the characterization of innocent amusement. George Norderly saved drowning victims. Henrietta Reed looks pretty choice in her swimsuit. And Red Stendhal is writing a book titled, Girls That Have Not Met Me, profusely illustrated. Four, 840 pages of people, girls that have met me. The picture on the top was uh, in the breeze, and it's of some bathing beauties. I don't know if they were at the Seton Club or not, but it's a pretty fun photo. Advertisers in the suburb breeze, that's 1916, gives us a clear picture of the mom and pop groceries and businesses serving island residents. Nordly had two launch services, the Norden and the Carrion. Joe Simerts was delivering ice, that's until he was bought up by, yes, John Iverson. Seton Cliff had reservations available, Phelps Island Grocery and Pembroke uh, groceries had staples and fancy groceries. And then of course Leonard Shadeen, Meets all trains at Seton. Next. 
By this 1925 map, the neighborhoods are platted, the streets are named, businesses and bridges are marked, and 10 docks are in. It is a busy place. You can see um, where uh, they have marked where the grocery stores are, where the, the neighborhood uh, clubhouses are. They got it going on. Also note up there on Pelican Point to the east, there is a channel now that cuts that peninsula. This is probably my favorite photo in the whole archives. It, it's timeless. It just screams, this is fabulous. And it wasn't until just shortly that I noticed that um, Debbie Height said, they turned over their canoe. That's why they're laughing. You can see the cottages in the background. This is Douglas That's Beach. Your <laughs> That's your dad? Yeah. No. Which one? This one's Danny's. Uh, Al Sherman. Oh. Oh, you've got to tell me. I wanted to know who these people are. It is just, look at that. They couldn't be happier. It's wonderful. Well, the one standing we know is Al Shervin, but we don't know, I don't know who the others are. Maybe we'll get to find out now. But the, the, the blonde, what year do you think that was taken? Um, it was probably about 1925, no, oh. wait, no, 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 about 1932. Oh, okay. Because he was born in 21. Okay. He was probably he about 10 there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, oh, thank you. That was fun to see. <laughs> Okay, by 1925 map, the neighborhoods are, oh, wait, 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 where are we going? Okay, 1920 communities, oh, okay. Pembroke Grocery was one of the earliest businesses advertised in the summer breeze in 1916 by owner Leo Jacobs. The store, also the post office, was located across from the Pembroke Dock. The 1930 and 1940 directories note that the business is now owned by Al and May Shervin. So you can see on the top, says, so, well, the Shervin family. Right? And then the lower photo is uh, an empty space where that uh, grocery slash post office was located. Pembroke Dock was directly across the street from the store and was a busy streetcar boat depot. Today, um, in the top photo, it is Don Shervin Park. So you can see from the uh, map where it was located. I added a photo of um, a young lady that's waiting for a launch or something there at Pembroke Dock in 1930. The Witchwood Inn shows up in the 1925 directory and clearly believes from its advertisement it is the place on Island Park to have a good time with free music and dancing. Next. This is Witchwood today still has a beautiful beach, and possibly is surrounded by some small homes that might be the remaining cottages. The 1925 directory lists more businesses to support the island. Devon Store uh, as, is at Service Road and Devon Dock. Divine Brothers uh, Grocery is at Tuxedo in London. Island Park Ice Company, Shoning's Grocery, Vandercook's Grocery at Devon in Manchester, Hollywood Grocery at Tuxedo and Clyde, plus the Hayes Store at Hollywood Cottages, Chester Park Store, and the Pembroke Grocery, of course, at Pembroke Dock. There is a lot going on on Island Park. Next. The history of the businesses at Chester Park are some of the best known, especially given its evolution. The Chester Park Dock became a busy depot in the early days of the island, island's development with postings in the 1925 and 30s Phelps Island Directory. And remember the photos I showed you of Cap Shadeen, he is, um, his launch is going through there probably several times a day. Early business ads have uh, a W. Rogers owning the filling station and the location was also a 3-2 tavern as you can see by Mrs. Les Fulton, and a superette. And that is Alquist and his niece, Janet. Daughter. Daughter, Janet. Let's see, okay. Uh, both the 1930 and the 1940 directory posts, the business is owned by Adolph and Hazel Hildebrandt in 1956. You can change it. 
They sell to Alan Alma Quist with, uh, and with renovation in 1960 by the Quist, Al and Almas is born. The Quist also introduced the Snark uh, as a charter boat service. In 1973, Quist sell to Bud and Eileen Nolan, and it's Bud that begins the Al and Almas cruises on Lake Minnetonka. In 1983, Merritt and Daryl Guyon are the Supper Club's newest owners, and in 1998, they remodel to what we see today. So it's still there. Okay. So let's go back to the cottages. Reverend Jonas Dressler and his wife Helen built the Willows in 1928 along Island View Road. That's on the eastern shore. The house plans from the cottage were from the Streeter Lumber Company and were also used for the Delatero cottages. Dressler built the stone fireplace and the foundation himself. By 1960, a breezeway and garage were added. The cottage name was for the willow trees overhanging the lake shore. Reverend Dressler was a professor at Northwest Seminary in Minneapolis and its president from 1950 to 1957. His son, George, also became a minister, and daughter, Helen, who, as I understand, is still alive at 97, uh, last year, has left the Historical Society with valuable images of her family's cabin and the surrounding history. <clears throat> um, here is Herman and Hulda Lindstrom. They came to the island in the early 1930s, so the censuses tell us. That's their first cabin. Next. They built their first cabin um, in Witchwood, and the property is seen um, at top right, so that cabin no longer exists. They built their second cabin across the street. Next. And that one does exist. And then finally, they built their third house. Grandfather built a grander home on two lots that he had bought earlier, and that one does still exist also. Next. During the Depression years, cottages with whimsical names like Crest Haven and Honolulu Inn were rented by city folks like sisters Rachel, Martha, and Aggie Lee, and their friends, Virginia, Marie, and Alma. This is Virginia and her boyfriend, Donald. Um, the women saved job money and rented cabins during the summers in the 1930s and would come out with their boyfriends away from their parents' crying <laughs> eyes. Lots of photos. This is another family. Uh, Julie Enroth's mother was one of these sisters, and she left her boxes of these photographs that Julie knew nothing about until her mother died. So we've got some great photos of Island Park. During the last, uh, oh, and this is the Honolulu Inn, um, and that is some of the family up there. You can kind of see them in the, um, on the porch. I left this, this big so you could see the outhouse on the side. During the last celebration of Island Park in 2007, Eric Serrano added this statement that best sums up memories from island residents and visitors alike. Those who grew up there from the 30s relished the memories of the sights and sounds of island life. And if they happen, as if they happened only a few moments ago. And this is uh, another one of the, uh, the photos that was left with uh, Julie Enroth. And that's in front of that Honolulu Inn. <clears throat> no history about Island Park would be complete without mentioning the Bowl family. Al Bowl, seen there with wife Jenny, was one of 13 children born in the family farm, on the family farm in western edge of Minnetrista. Jenny's parents were John and Julia Iverson. You have met them. At, uh, and they were some of the earliest Island Park residents. During the 1930s and 60s, Iversons and the Bulls were involved in all aspects of island life. School bus and passenger service, ice delivery and road plowing, plus law enforcement, as Al was the island constable. Son Donnie Bull says, Dad had the keys to every business because we delivered ice to everyone, although we didn't need keys because no one locked their doors. Donnie also remembers he began helping the family at an early age. The ice business, fixing roads, cutting grass with a push mower, even driving the family truck at 12. My father and grandfather made everything we used, from toys to tools, 
Al was also the fire chief, the school bus driver for many years after his father-in-law retired. In a recent interview, Donnie was asked what stands out most to him about his life on Island Park and his family's involvement. And he said, my family's work ethic impresses me most. It wasn't until I was much older that I gave a lot of thought to my family's accomplishments. My grandfather, John Iverson, came to this country not speaking English and was an early entrepreneur. His example taught me how to work. By the time Donnie was born, his grandfather delivered ice to everyone on the island. He had bought out the other two ice people and had a fleet of delivery vehicles. He had also bought out Cap Shadeen. The home images are both Iverson and Bull homes. The cottage on the top was built by John Iverson, we just saw that, and used until John built the house on the bottom. Then Al and Jenny lived in the cottage when they first moved to the island. Later, they lived in the big house. The big house structurally damaged in the 1965 tornado was condemned and torn down. And this is what sits on that site now. I wish we had a better photo of their other house, but the only one I had was, was covered in snow. Next. The Village Hall has received much attention over the past year. The focus of the Village Hall Preservation Society. The building was built by the WPA in 1936 and is currently preparing to be admitted to the National Register of Historic Properties. Yay. They worked very, very hard. Writer Bill Guntel writes, and this is from that 2007 Laker Pioneer, this is not just an old building by, built by the WPA during the Depression. Over the years, it was the most important structure on the island and was part of everyone's life. It was the headquarters of the community, the town hall. It was the central gathering points for all events, big and small. It was used for village meetings, voting, religious services, dances, weddings and funerals, the courthouse upstairs, lectures, potluck dinners, banquets, holiday programs, political speeches, and the home of the Island Park Volunteer Department, Fire Department. Uh, at your chair, you'll probably notice you've received some information about the preservation efforts. We're fortunate to have Holly. Holly, where are you? Stand up. Holly. Ah, there's Holly, Holly Thurman. <clears throat> Please feel free to offer your support at the end and ask questions and read the information that she has offered you. Next picture. And these are some of the events. Um, Sue Schmidt says the heart and soul of Island Park was the revered Island Park Village Hall. This is the mother-daughter banquet held on May 11th in 1946. You can see the mothers and the daughters in the audience and all the guys in the back are the servers. This is the Village Hall today, just a few days ago. That brings us to the Island Park Fire Department. As mentioned, it was housed in the Village Hall. This was an organization completely devoted to its community. Organized in 1933, a public meeting was held at the Pembroke Community House, inviting all eligible males of the island to attend with interest in joining the association. According to its charter, the aim and purpose of the association was to create, uh, through public spirit, without loss to, to the village, a fund to purchase a fire truck and firefighting equipment. The purpose um, was to fight fires, protect public life, and create neighborhood social spirit in the village. In 1934, the organization purchased the lots that would locate the village hall. So they bought the property that the Village Hall was um, built on, and they um, interacted with the WPEA, uh, WPA to have it built. Next. In 1935, the fire department held the first fireman's field days. This is not it, but this is years later. Um, an August highlight for the next 27 years. The last one was held in 1962. Events included watermelon eating contests, water ball fights, all-wheel parades, bake sales, games, and races. Sue Schmidt said, what started as a fundraiser in 1935 involved in, evolved into an all-community event. And this is the water fight. 
and sometime later the women's auxiliary became part of the water fight events. I like this picture because it shows you the cottages in the back. By 1940, more and more residents became year-round, and suburb cabins became renovated to be able to be used all year. This is the Chester Park Beach, July 1940. Anybody, anybody, any of these people? We do know who these people are, though. I didn't write it down, though, sorry. Next. The Rockfam family moved to the island during these years, and Island Park is not without its drama, as one such story begins on a spring day in 1944. Oh, God. Oh, do I have it? Did I not bring it? Tom can tell you the story. Tom can tell us the story, but I think I can tell I've written it so many times. So, the, the uh, four-year-old on the shovel sliding down is Tom Rockfam. Tom, yeah. wave your hands. And the uh, gentleman with the sailor hat is Richie Lindstrom, Debbie's uncle. It's Debbie. Okay, so spring day 1945, and Tommy Rockfam is enthralled with the uh, water running quickly down um, a kind of a ditch area because it's spring. Um, some older boys are at a nearby grocery store uh, talking about what they're going to do for the day. They disband, Richie starts to walk home, and he sees floating in the ditch what looks like a child upside down, face down. He jumps in, saves the child, wow. um, rock them, pulls him out, Tommy sputtering, crying, gets home. And it develops into a lifelong friendship for both of them. It was a better story the way Tom wrote it, but <laughs> that's the, that was the excitement for the day. That's a fun story. Next. The 1950s, the Andersons and the Wickners began spending the summers at their cabins on Arden Commons. This is some of the Anderson and Wickner family on their sailboat near the Arden docks. You can see that things are really building up. You can see all the docks in the background. <clears throat> okay. In 1950, move on. Jim and Dorothy Wickner Anderson completed their summer cabin. You can see up on the top. Over the years, it it becomes a year-round residence. Both Jim and Dorothy live there until they died. Today, their daughter, Arlen, owns the family cottage, seen at the bottom. Dorothy's parents' home at the north end of the commons, okay, that's the Wickners, you can't see that there, but, well, the house is gone, um, was destroyed by the 1965 tornado. That was uh, next door to the Paulsons' house. They were the two that were killed during that storm. So both of those houses were destroyed. <clears throat> Therrelson's Texaco Station, later known as Skelly Service Station, was located on the curve at Tuxedo and Brighton Boulevards. The station was destroyed uh, by fire in the 1960s. Next. And this is that space today. The building that was once Grimm's Grocery and Shonings, also at Brighton and Tuxedo, is still standing today as a private home. And see where the star is, where it was located, and directly across the street. On the opposite corner um, is a uh, grocery that was owned by the Nelsons Woods and later was by, uh, owned by the Spiritus family, was Coffee Cup Cafe. And that building is a, um, a private residence today as well. Here's Al Bryce, heralding in the 1960s. So in 1963, Island Park was annexed and merged in with the city of Mound. Island Park Mayor Glenn Rogers is ceremoniously giving the keys to the city to the Mound Mayor Bert Larson in the last official city action. It's in the Minnetonka pilot. 
And in 1965, Island Park was once again hit by a tornado, suffering loss of life and buildings by the time the storm had passed. Many locals here probably still remember where they were when the storm arrived and what life was like in its aftermath. The, oh, there we go. The photo on the right uh, was taken, wait, go up again, go back. There we go. Photo on the right was taken by Jenny Iverson Bowl. Uh, forever capturing the horrific damage caused by the storm at Arden Beach area where the storm uh, actually came in and made landfall. And the next photo is the devastation as it came through. If you look at the house on the upper right corner, that's the house I showed you was the third home of the Lindstroms. Remember he built three houses. This is his third home. Came right up through there and you can see it's destroyed. There are many, many more photos of that destruction. That is, and this presentation is made possible with the assistance from the Anderson Family Collection, the Tyson Family Collection, Scott McGinnis, historian and um, um, from Excelsior Lake Minnetonka Historical Society helped me a lot. Of course, Tom Rockfam's Family Collection, Darrelson's Family Collection, and then the archives at the Historical Society. This particular photo uh, is Wonderful. You can see Maple Heights. There is a house hidden behind the trees to the left. There is another house that we can't see that I'm going to try and figure out who it belonged to. They have a beautiful boathouse. And then there's one more house in uh, the trees. There are actually four homes in that picture and a really beautiful sailboat. So we're going to get to the bottom of that one. That is, we're going to find out who owned those houses. One minute to spare.